Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis on this June 20th, uh, 20th, 21st. I'm going to get my dates right here. June 21st, 2018, and we're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload coming your way. Now, what we normally would be doing right now is going straight into our Prager University segment. That's normally what we do, except today we have such a jam-packed episode that we had to just put that on the chopping block. So I do not have a Prager University segment. We concluded last week's show with a look at the DFL State Convention that was held the 1st through the 3rd of June. And we wanted to give you an opportunity to see a little bit of each of the speeches. Um, there was just a lot going on, and of course with the other stuff we covered last week, we weren't able to really go too in-depth with the DFL State Convention. And the fact is, we didn't have our camera crew down there because the Republicans were meeting up in Duluth on the same uh, same day, well, it was the first and second. So as a result, we had a camera crew up in Duluth. We didn't have a camera crew in uh, in uh, Rochester. So what we are going to focus on today is the Republican State Convention. Uh, I'm going to state right off the top because of having more content than we have available time. We're only limited to an hour show. Uh, we are not going to be showing every single candidate who ran for office. Uh, there are a lot of qualified candidates, a lot of great people, uh, and it was the same with the DFL. You know, they had you know their fight, you know, in Rochester, and we couldn't cover everybody. So what we are going to do is focus um, narrowly only on those who had either, were either incumbents or were um, the people who received the endorsement. So, with that being said, we are actually going to start with uh, the, the first three segments we're going to do are speeches from Republican members of Congress. Uh, there are only three of them. Uh, so, what we're going to do right now is look at Tom Emmer, Congressman from Minnesota's 6th Congressional District, and his remarks in front of the Republican State Convention. Uh, good morning to all of you. It's great to be with all of you. Yeah, we can do that. It can be like a Republican revival. Good morning to all of you. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. It's great to be with all of you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for everything you do for our party and for our shared cause. What a night we had last night. Electronic ballots. I'm sorry, Jennifer, too soon? She says too soon. Great candidates and great parties. Congratulations to our U.S. Senate candidates, Karen Housley and Jim Newberger. We got that done last night, but we got a lot of work to do today. I don't think we do it enough. Can we thank all our military veterans and active servicemen and women and any law enforcement that are here today, please stand so that we can recognize you. Let's set the stage. Look around. We're all on the same team. We don't have to live in the same neighborhood. We don't have to look the same. We don't have to sound the same. We don't have to agree on everything. We don't have to even like the same things. Heck, we don't even have to like each other. <laughs> no, it's true, we don't. But that doesn't change, and you're going to hear from another great team guy. You heard from Phil Housley last night. I'm telling you, you're going to hear from a guy named Pete Stauber that we all know. He knows team. We know team. You don't have to live together. You don't have to be close friends, but you do have to be a team. You need to work together. We need to match our strengths and limit our weaknesses. So together, together next fall, we can turn Minnesota red. Why do I quickly go through these? Because we are winning, and I don't care what anybody tries to tell you. We are winning. So my question to you this morning, to all of us this morning, is are you tired of winning? No! I'm not either. Now we have to continue what we've started. Again, the national pundits want us to believe there is a blue wave on the horizon. But that's not 
no blue wave. That's not what we're seeing. And that's not what today's numbers are telling us. In fact, the congressional generic ballot is the best, I'll emphasize it again, the best it has been for Republicans since 2016. But they don't want to tell you that. That's right. But keep in mind, that doesn't mean winning in November is going to come easy, especially here in Minnesota. We've got work to do. Remember, Minnesota hasn't elected a Republican presidential candidate since 1972, as Jennifer just told you. I want to add another one. She told you that we have the possibility of having six out of eight U.S. representatives in our delegation. Ladies and gentlemen, we have not had a Republican congressional majority since 1982. That's 36 years. I think that's too long. Do you think that's too long? Yeah. And as the deputy chair of the National Republican Congressional Committee, I am committed to work hard every day to make sure we never hear the three worst possible words in politics. Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Okay, that's it. The table's set. Remember, when we're done today, we're going home. We're going to tell our family, our friends, and our co-workers, our neighbors, now is the time to unite for November. Good luck to all our candidates today. Remember, together we can and we will turn Minnesota red. May God bless all of us, and may God continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you. And that was Congressman Tom Emmer from Minnesota's 6th Congressional District. Uh, Congressman Emmer is probably not going to have a problem getting reelected in November. Uh, he is in probably the safest Republican seat in the state. Uh, but we are now going to take a look at one incumbent Republican who may be in trouble, and that is Congressman Eric Paulson in the 3rd Congressional District, which is the southern Minneapolis suburbs. So here's Congressman Paulson. Look, I just want to make sure you all know, for the past year, Republicans have been working hard to reverse all of these mistakes of Obama's eight-year tenure. On everything, from foreign policy to crippling regulations, Obamacare, and of course, a really sluggish economy. And we are absolutely implementing a vision of reform that you can be proud of. And look, things are looking pretty good. Just yesterday, we received the outstanding news that the Republican tax cuts are working. Our economy added another couple hundred thousand jobs. <laughs> Unemployment now is at the lowest rate it's been in 18 years. Really good opportunity. <laughs> Business optimism is at records highs. Capital investment is up. Workers are getting bigger paychecks. They're getting special bonuses. They're getting better benefits. And now Nancy Pelosi, calls these crumbs. We all know that's not true. This is real money in people's pockets. And I'll just tell you, for me, it's about one fundamental question. Who gets to decide to spend your money? Would you work hard for your money? Who decides what to do with it? Is it going to be you or is it some nameless, faceless bureaucrat in Washington who doesn't know your name? Because when a family with young children is working hard to fund their children's future, who gets to decide? how to spend their money. Is it that family or is it Washington? When a single mom is working hard every single day for a better life for her daughter, who decides where her money goes? And when that small business owner who's working late into the night, through the weekend, risking every penny that they have invested to reach their dream, who gets to keep that meager profit that they may be able to earn? Does it go to you who earned it? Or when you're exhausted at the end of a long day? Or is it going to end up going to the federal government, taken by someone who doesn't even know your name until it's April 15th? <laughs> Our Republican vision makes sure that hardworking taxpayers can keep more of their hard-earned money. We let Americans get back to work. Our local businesses no longer have to compete with other countries with one hand tied behind their back. And we absolutely recognize that our country's greatest asset is the American people. It's America's days are now best ahead. And here's the fundamental question. Are you better off now than you were 16 months ago? We've seen millions of hardworking families now get those bigger paychecks, get those extra bonuses, and get better benefits. But Dean Phillips wants to undo it all and raise your taxes. We will not let that happen. I will not be out-hustled, 
And I'm going to tell you today, we will re-elect Tom Emmer. We will re-elect Jason Lewis. We will turn the 1st District red. We will turn the 8th District red. We are going to turn this state red. And also, I know that we can do it because working together, we will make sure that America and Minnesota keeps moving forward toward a more prosperous, safer, and freer future. God bless all of you. Thank you for what you do. Let's win big. I'm ready to go and turn this state red come November. Have a great convention. Now, I will state that we're only showing you excerpts. Uh, a lot of these speeches go on for 10, 15 minutes, and there's some great stuff in, in most of them. Uh, uh, we just don't have enough time. So what we've done, or, or gonna, well, yeah, what we've done is we have put the um, full speeches up on our uh, YouTube channel, youtube.com slash northstaroasis, and our Facebook channel, facebook.com slash northstaroasis, so you can actually get more information if, uh, about any of these people that we're focusing, if you so desire. So up next, we're going to take a look at our last of the three Republican incumbent members of Congress, freshman representative Jason Lewis from the 2nd Congressional District. Thank you all very much. Thank you, delegates. Thank you, taxpayers. Very proud taxpayers, but I'm certain you could be just as proud for half the money. <laughs> Thank you, citizens of this great state and soon-to-be red state of Minnesota. <laughs> Greetings from Washington, where one week you're on the cover of time, the next week you're doing it. <laughs> You know, you go to your first committee meeting, you go to your first vote on the House floor, and it's very, very dramatic, and you look around the room and see all those famous people, and you say, I I'm not certain I belong here. And then after about four or five months, you go back to the same place, you look around the room, and you look at all those people, and you say, I'm not certain they belong here. <laughs> you, know, you know, the question before us in this first big reelect of the Trump presidency of 2018 is pretty simple. And it's why you're here, and why you put in all the hours and all the work you do. The question is, who can you trust with power? It's as simple as that. It's a straightforward question, but the differences between the parties couldn't be more stark. You see, my friends, Democrats seek power in order to use force. We seek power in order to limit it. And for some time, as you all know, our opponents, since about Inauguration Day, our opponents have been campaigning for 2018. The most radical of whom have crashed congressional offices, staged demonstrations, trespassed on private property, yes, including mine. You've seen it all around, even if the mainstream press hasn't. But I can tell you, that's why this means so much. That's why this re-elect means so much. Because while these out-of-touch, hardcore, left-wing activists were up to their usual antics, we Republicans in Congress were actually getting things done. We've been focused on the job of getting this country moving again, and I can tell you, here and now, we have accomplished that job, we are growing again, we are prospering again, and people have more take-home pay in their checks again. In this 115th Congress, we've passed the RAINS Act that says if an executive branch agency wants to impose a regulation without a vote, anybody remember Article 1? Without a vote, it has to come back to Congress to get approved. We've talked about this for 25 years. We passed it. We've passed 16, 16 Congressional Review Acts undoing Obama-era regulations, saving taxpayers and saving workers and businesses $3.7 billion in regulation. Anybody remember the waters of the U.S. rule? That was one of the first to go. We will vote by acclamation. All those in favor of endorsing Doug Wardlow for Attorney General, please rise. It is the judgment of the chair that Mr. Wardlow has received 60% of the support of the body. 
So congratulations on your endorsement. <laughs> and so your choice for Attorney General will be either Doug Wardlow or whoever comes out of the DFL primary on August 14th. And that's one, you know, one of those people who will actually become the new Attorney General now that the incumbent, Lori Swanson, is no longer seeking that position. Now, we do have two U.S. Senate races that are on the ballot. And for the seat going against incumbent U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar, is Jim Newberger, who is a for, uh, formerly a guest of this show. So here is Jim Newberger's endorsement. Well, good evening. Oh, you Republicans, good evening. good evening. There we go. I'm gonna get my glasses on. Here we go. I'm Jim, and uh, these are my friends, and this is my family. I stand and I humbly ask for your endorsement. By the grace of God, I was endorsed in 2012, and I was elected to the Minnesota House. I went right from the grassroots and into the swamp. This year, after three terms, I'm imposing my own term limits, and I'm stepping away from a very strong Republican seat because the 12-year reign of ultra-liberal Amy Klobuchar must come to an end. Yes. I was able to stop the DFL-led Department of Commerce when combat vets with PTSD came home from war. They tried to go back to work, and instead of helping our veterans, the Department of Commerce revoked their professional licenses and slapped them with fines up to $60,000. I changed the law to give our veterans the help that they need. Yeah, Jim. Folks, when you send me to Washington, I'll go after these massive federal agencies because they are destroying America as we know it. President Trump needs our help, and I look forward to helping him drain the swamp. In order to do this, Minnesota needs to send Senator Klobuchar packing, gone. She's had 12 years, folks, and now she's asking for six more. For nearly a decade, she has fed the swamp with her 90% pro-Obama voting record. It's time for Minnesota to have a senator who will stand up for America. We must stop federal funding for any sanctuary city. Minnesota needs a senator who will stand up for our Second Amendment rights. Perhaps Senator Klobuchar needs to be reminded that her, that her fellow Democrat, Vice President Hubert H. Humphrey, once said, quote, the right of the citizens to bear arms is just one guarantee against arbitrary government. It's one more safeguard against tyranny. Minnesota needs a senator who will stand up for life and not seek to destroy it. Minnesota needs a senator who will actually do something for the good folks right here on the Iron Range and clear a path for copper and nickel mining. Polymet must come in here. Yeah. Our workers, they demand a senator who will stand up for energy and jobs, and our farmers are praying for a senator who will simply get the government off of their backs. Our future demands a senator who will stand against rising taxes and put Obamacare into its grave. As your next senator, as your next U.S. Senator, I will fight for these things and I will stand up for you. Now some will ask, can we win? Can we win? Yeah. Yes, we can! With you, we the polls are shifting to the right. Donald Trump came within one and a half points of winning Minnesota. Trump won five of our eight congressional districts. <laughs> yeah! We must reach all eight of our districts, not by asking three simple questions. I really wish it were that easy. Because if it was, conservative groups would have recruited thousands, thousands of GOP voters years ago. 
The simple truth is we reach the urban core with real solutions. We close the education gap by allowing school choice and we free up, yes, we free up the billions of potential dollars that are being trapped in our school trust lands. We give people a hand up, not just a hand out, and we develop an environment where people can get a career, not just a job. In closing, it's time to choose. We can let Amy Klobuchar feed the swamp six more years. No. Oh. Or we can send one of our own to Washington. Yeah. Yeah. The choice is before you this day. I humbly ask, I humbly ask for your endorsement for the United States Senate. Thank you and God bless you. That was Jim Newberger, who is the endorsed Republican candidate to take on U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar on the November general ballot. And we still have another U.S. Senate seat on the ballot this year. This is the one for Al Franken's vacated seat. And the Republican endorsed candidate will face either uh, Tina Smith or... Richard Painter, whoever wins that DFL primary uh, coming up in August. And it's State Senator Car Karen Housley is the endorsed GOP candidate. Here is her uh, endorsement speech. We are here. We are here. Finally, this is the day I've been waiting for since December 20th when I announced I was running for the vacated Al Franken seat. Thank you. Because of your hard work, the Republican Party in Minnesota is better, stronger, and smarter than ever before, putting us in an excellent position to defeat Tina Smith and elect a Republican to the United States Senate who will put Minnesotans first and get things done. Earlier this year, I decided to run for the United States Senate against Tina Smith. If you're one of the 90% of Minnesotans who don't know who Tina Smith is, thank you, Senator Benson. <laughs> she was Governor Dayton's hand-picked replacement for the disgraced Al Franken. <laughs> A lot of people have been asking me why would I run for the United States Senate. Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. Real Minnesotans need representations too, not just the metro area liberal elites. The truth is, when I look at Washington, I see nothing but dysfunction, obstruction, and a partisan divide that has grown worse than ever before. If the people of Minnesota send me to Washington, I know I can get things done. We can't afford more of the status quo, and right now, that's exactly what we're getting. Like you, I recognize that who we elect to the Senate in November will have a critical impact on the future of our nation and the next generation of Minnesotans. If you know me, you know that my entire life has been about getting things done. My parents, both public school teachers, raised me to work hard, play fair, and do the right thing. Whether it was doing chores, finishing home homework, or helping out to take care of my little sister, we were taught there is nothing more important, important than our commitment, integrity, and respect. Work hard, play fair, do the right thing. It's that simple. Minnesota is my home, and I want to do what I can make to do to make Minnesota a better place to live, raise a family, and retire. In 2012, I saw an opportunity to serve the communities I loved, so I ran for the state senate. Despite what you hear on the news about legislative gridlock, I was able to get things done there, too. I exposed the Dayton Smith administration's overwhelming failure of their own state government that led to rampant abuse and neglect of our elderly and vulnerable population. I held them accountable and the press started to pay attention. We were able to hold long overdue hearings to investigate these horrifying abuses of our elderly and I'm proud to be leading the fight for a meaningful legislation that protects the elderly and our most vulnerable here in the state of Minnesota. 
A quick scroll through Tina Smith's social media will tell you everything you need to know about her. Tina is a self-proclaimed member of the resistance, and she's a failed puppet of Chuck Schumer and Elizabeth Warren, and someone who proudly votes no on almost every single federal appointment or piece of legislation that crosses her decks. This do-nothing mentality is nothing new for Tina Smith. She did nothing as Governor Dayton's chief of staff. She did nothing as Governor Dayton's lieutenant governor. The only time Tina Smith actually did anything was when she was a high-powered lobbyist for Planned Parenthood. The taxpayers of Minnesota deserve a U.S. Senator who will work with our president to fix our immigration problem, secure our borders, stand up to North Korea, cut our taxes, fix health care, and protect the sanctity of life. I am that person. Here in Minnesota, we know our liberty comes from God, not the government. We're not afraid to love our neighbors and do what's right. I support the entire Constitution, not just the parts that might be politically convenient, and that includes the Second Amendment. In Washington, I will stand with law-abiding gun owners and sportsmen and women to, of Minnesota to keep the radical progressives away from our guns. Tina Smith's days of obstruction are numbered, and she knows it. Together, we can replace our do-nothing senator with a proven leader and a devoted public servant who will get things done. Now, who's with me? Thank you all for coming again, and I really appreciate it. I look for your endorsement. I would, I, would, I would be honored, humbly honored, to get your endorsement. Thank you. God bless you. God bless Minnesota. And God bless the United States of America. And that was Republican U.S. Senate candidate Karen Housley. She will be running against uh, Tina Smith or Richard Painter, whoever wins that primary. And we have one more race in which we are going to take a look at. And this was the most contested race of the two-day convention for the Republicans. Uh, you had three qualified candidates who were running and it was Jeff Johnson who won that nomination on the third ballot after Mary Giuliani Stevens and um, Phil Parrish had both uh, withdrawn from the race. Uh, all three of them gave an exceptional effort, and yet it was Jeff Johnson who became the Republican nominee. So let's take a look at Jeff Johnson's convention speech. Thank you all so much. You guys are awesome. I'm here today to ask for your endorsement, and I will abide by your endorsement, and together we're going to give people their government back in this state. So please join me. So, so many of you know who I am, but for those of you who don't, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. First and foremost, more important than anything else, I am a husband, a father, a very proud American, and a follower of Jesus Christ. That's first. I am an unflinching defender of our Second Amendment rights, and I am an advocate for the elderly and the disabled and the unborn, the most vulnerable people in our state. And I, I happen to believe that the role of the federal government when it comes to our state should be limited to three things. Defending our borders, delivering our mail, and staying the hell out of our business. So. So, as your new governor, I will be on a plane to explain to Attorney General Sessions or whoever else I have to that until we tell them otherwise, Minnesota's participation in the refugee resettlement program is going to stop, period. I believe that we know best not the government, what our health insurance should look like, or how we commute to work, or what we eat or drink, or what sort of fireworks we buy, for Christ's sake. My boys don't need a nanny anymore, and neither do you. We're going to get Minnesota out of the nannying business once and for all. Although it's back in court, naturally. 
We have promoted economic growth, and now the Atlanta Fed says for the first time in over a decade, this quarter might see 4% growth. Heck, I've even reached across the aisle to, to reduce the number of federal crimes. The Constitution mentions three crimes. We have 4,500 federal criminal laws. And I'm working to reduce those because every single day, average Americans might be in jeopardy and not even know it. There was a fellow that wrote a book a few years ago called Three Felonies a Day. The average number of federal violations you commit without knowing it. So if I can work across the aisle to reduce the power of this nanny state, I'll do it with anybody. Yeah. And it's also true. It's also true that sometimes you're forced to take a few votes against your party leadership. And I did that. After all, I took an oath to defend one thing, and I intend to fulfill that oath, and that is the Constitution of the United States. So when it comes to reducing debt and deficits, spying on American citizens, and yes, fighting the Metropolitan Council of Minneapolis-St. Paul, I am going to be a reliable and independent voice in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Folks, it is time to finish off liberals like Angie Craig and what they represent once and for all and turn Minnesota red in 2018. <laughs> let, me just, let me just finish with this. The fact of the matter is, this Democrat party is now the party of chaos. They are throwing a collective temper tantrum because they're so used to getting what they want. Call it the empire striking back. But instead of reining in the darkest impulses from their most radical followers, Democrats like Angie Craig and Democrats in Minnesota have embraced their dangerous attempts to silence their opponents by any means necessary. That's why the stakes this year could not be higher. I will tell you, friends, a political movement which believes the ends justify the means in the attainment of power is one that can never be trusted with it. As I said, as I said in the beginning, the difference is simple. We want more freedom, they want more power. This election will determine whether we finish the job of restoring the American dream by upholding those sacred constitutional principles we all hold dear, or whether we will backslide down a slippery slope towards a country our parents wouldn't recognize. My promise to you today, as you begin this convention, is just as it was two years ago. I vow to never let that happen, and I intend to fulfill my vow. Let's give Minnesota something else to offer, let's make it red this fall, and let's go get them in 2018. Thank you very much. And that was 2nd District Republican Congressman Jason Lewis with his convention speech at the Minnesota State Convention. Uh, again, because we have a dearth of candidates for office, uh, we're, we're not looking at any of the challenger races at this time. Uh, but like I say, we do have our, the rest of them on our uh, Facebook and YouTube channels. Moving on to Secretary of State is John Howe. And this is what he had to say on, uh, for his nominating speech. And I'm Lisa Howe, his wife, partner, and number one supporter. And I nominate John Howe for Secretary of State, along with my daughter, Caitlin Howe. Good morning. How are we doing today? All right. Let's get fired up. Boy, we've heard from a lot of great candidates, and I tell you, it's so great to be here. You know, four years I asked for the nomination for Secretary of State. I didn't get it. Persistence pays off. I'm back again to ask for your support and your endorsement for Secretary of State. You know, in 2012, 13 Democratic senators violated the campaign coordination law. 11 of them became sitting Minnesota Senators. And we lost the majority in the Senate and in the House. When I'm the Secretary of State, if you cheat, you're not going to get to keep your seat. All the DFL had to do that year 
was pay a $100,000 settlement. That's all they had to do. And they got to retain those 11 Minnesota Senate seats. That's not going to happen. We're going to bring election integrity. We want fair and honest elections. And you should not be using the Secretary of State's office for partisan politics. So I need your support. I need you to spread our name. When somebody says, I'm not, the only campaign promise I'm going to make is not to mention my opponent's name because no one really knows who the Secretary of State's are. We do because we're in politics. But when somebody asks you who you're going to vote for, you don't say who, you say oh. thank you. Okay, because we have just one candidate, the body may move to handle the process without ballots and I would entertain a motion to... I didn't even finish. I have a motion and I have a second. Uh, all in favor of voting to endorse by acclamation say aye. Aye. And you over there if you want to vote no. Motion carries. And so John Howe was endorsed as the Republican candidate for Secretary of State. He will be going against Steve Simon, who received the DFL endorsement for that office. So now we're going to take a look at the state auditor's position. Who will get the right to run against Julia Blaha for that position? And the Republican candidate is Pam Myra. Let's take a look. Thank you so much, nominating committee, for your report, and representative for your kind shout out, and Kristen, my eldest daughter, and Carrie, thank you so much. And I want to thank you. Thank you for being here, bright-eyed and ready. What a commitment and dedication. The expense you've paid, the time and the effort. You really have my sincere thanks. About a month ago, I was making fundraising calls, and I called an individual, and he got on the line, and I could hear how nervous he was in there. He, and he said, well, my executive assistant said this was the auditor. And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm not that auditor. I'm the auditor you want. <laughs> I want to clear something up. I won't be auditing any of you, and the office will not be auditing any of you. I will be, and the office will be auditing for you. I will be leading the office, <laughs> and setting the tone to do financial and performance audits and reviews of governmental units and programs to find out if they're effective and efficient. And uh, to have transparency and accountability. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Yes. <laughs> Do you want an auditor who is experienced and knowledgeable about auditing? Yes! <laughs> so do I. <laughs> I'm a certified public accountant with an active license, a former audit manager at an international public accounting firm. And I was asked a number of times to run for this office and I just always kept saying no. And then the last time I was asked, I didn't say no. I actually decided, you know, I'm gonna go look at the US or the Minnesota Constitution, see what it says. And I did, and it directed me to Minnesota statute. And I was sitting there and I started to tremble I trembled out of anger. It's outdated and it needs to be worked on to be better and more effective to protect our resources, government resources, our tax dollars. And so I am so excited to be able to take on this role and run for this candidacy. I thought, you know what? I can be that catalyst to change that statute and work with the legislature, work with the governor, not against the governor as the current auditor has. <laughs> you know, this seat is one of only two statewide seats that is open. The current auditor is running for governor. And with my qualifications, there is a clear path to victory. I would greatly appreciate your support, greatly appreciate your endorsement today. Thank you so much for your time.
Okay, because we only have one candidate, the body may move to handle the process without ballots, or we could do clay tablet, your choice. So I would entertain a motion to vote by rising acclamation. Do I have a second? All in favor of voting by rising acclamation, say aye. Aye. Those opposed? <laughs> Tough crowd. Motion carries. All right. So, all of those in favor of endorsing Pam Myra for state auditor, please rise. We got it. So Pam Myra becomes the endorsed Republican candidate for the position of state auditor. And there's still another constitutional officer uh, position on the ballot that the GOP had to endorse. And so for attorney general, for the right to go against whoever wins the DFL primary, uh, see our show last week when we actually covered that race, and there's a lot of candidates. Uh, but the winner of the DFL primary will go against Doug Wardlow, and here is Wardlow's endorsement. I am Doug Wardlow, and I humbly ask for your endorsement to be the next Attorney General of Minnesota. So, my friends, we have a problem in Minnesota. I can sum up that problem for you in one word. Government. <laughs> Our state government is far too large. It does far too much. And then when it comes to the things that government really must do, like keeping our families safe and defending our freedoms, it falls short. Let me give you an example. You've probably heard about the, the situation we have with daycare fraud being committed by Somali daycare centers. Every year, tens of millions of dollars are being defrauded from the state. And every year, tens of millions of dollars are going overseas to Huwala's money courier services in the Horn of Africa, at least one of which is controlled by Al-Shabaab. Now, the Attorney General is the top law enforcement officer in the state. The Attorney General is the top legal officer in the state. And the Attorney General is the only statewide official with the duty and the authority to prosecute welfare fraud. So, what has Lori Swanson, our current Attorney General, been doing? Nothing. Nothing, that's right. She has been entirely silent. She has not brought a single civil case to recover funds on behalf of the state. She hasn't brought a single prosecution. She has been derelict in her duties, and that is unacceptable. You know, you, you, can, have, you can have all of the laws you want, but if you don't enforce them, they're not worth the paper they're printed on. So what has Lori Swanson been doing? Well, she's been suing the president. She has sued the president to block the travel ban. She sued the president to prevent him from putting a question on the census about citizenship. These are entirely baseless, entirely political lawsuits. She's pushing her own political agenda at the expense of Minnesotans. And meanwhile, taxpayer dollars are going overseas to fund terrorists. That has to stop. You know, when I am attorney general, I will never put politics above the rule of law. I'm going to enforce the law. I'm going to stand up for the Constitution. I'm going to stand up for the people. And I'm going to prosecute and bring an end to welfare fraud in our state. Yeah. It starts with defending our Constitution. And that is something I know how to do. For the last several years, I've been working with a group called Alliance Defending Freedom. It's a Christian nonprofit law firm. And we stand up for and represent folks who are defending their religious liberty and free speech and rights of conscience in cases across the country. So you can rest assured that when I'm Attorney General, I will be in the courtroom for you, I will be standing up for religious freedom, I will be standing up for free speech, and I will be fighting for the Second Amendment as well. Yeah. I also spent a couple of years working for Bob Lighthizer, who is now the United States Trade Representative under Donald Trump. I spent those couple of years fighting unfairly dumped and subsidized imports of steel from China. So I'm going to continue the fight against unfair imports when I'm Attorney General, and I'm going to stand up for Minnesota jobs, I'm going to stand up for mining. We are going to put Minnesota first. Yes. So please, so please join me. 
Let's stand up for the Constitution. Let's stand up for the rule of law. Let's stand up for faith and for freedom and for justice. Together, we are going to win in 2018. We are going to finally put this state firmly back on the path to liberty and prosperity. Thank you. God bless. We have just one candidate before the body, and therefore I will entertain a motion to endorse by acclamation. And a second. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> well done. <laughs> Amen. Oh, and one more thing about me. I am the Met Council's worst nightmare. <laughs> But none of that matters if we don't win. And I really believe that there's a lot to winning, but it boils down to two big things. Number one, we have to choose our strongest candidate. And number two, we have to have a, a message that captures the imagination of Minnesotans from every walk of life and every corner of this state. Sandy and I spent the first half of our lives in northwestern Minnesota. And I did extremely well in 2014, but Donald Trump proved to me that we can blow the freaking roof up of greater Minnesota this fall if we do it right, and that's exactly what I intend to do. And by the way, having a Marine from Duluth help us kick some butt in the 8th Congressional District ain't going to hurt either. Thank you, Donna. I've been in the heart of Minneapolis for nine years trying to solve some really difficult problems. And my message to those good people is really simple. The DFL has gotten fat off of your boats for 50 years and they've done absolutely nothing to help you. I'm going to fight for you and your children whether you are Republicans or not. We have to challenge DFL hypocrisy everywhere in this state. But along with picking the best candidate, we have to share a vision that just lights a fire under Minnesotans and we have to give special attention to all those new voters that Donald Trump brought out in 2016. And I've had people say to me, Jeff, you can't win Trump voters, you're not angry enough. But Donald Trump didn't win because he was angry, he won because, because he gave hope to all of the forgotten Americans who thought no one cared about them in government anymore. And there are a lot of forgotten Minnesotans too. I see a state where no one believes anymore that the system is rigged, where we have drained our own little swamp right here in Minnesota, where legislative sessions no longer end in midnight backroom deals, and where you have a governor that proudly vetoes every garbage omnibus bill that violates our Minnesota Constitution. That is my vision. I see a state where we are demanding that our state agencies actually do serve the people. So, you know, I intend to make bureaucrats spend a few days every year working for those whom they regulate. So, for example, the ones who devise the buffer strip law, they get to come to your farm and work for you, and you can explain to them directly how well their genius plan is actually panning out. <laughs> and finally, I see a state where we are lifting up not the powerful, not the famous, but the everyday heroes in Minnesota, the ones who get up at 5 a.m. every day and work the assembly line or, or drive the truck or serve and protect us, the ones who raise their kids right and pay their taxes and volunteer their time, those are the people I grew up with. Those are the people who make Minnesota so extraordinary. And I want to lead a state where those Minnesotans have replaced the CEOs and the lobbyists as the ones we listen to when we're making tough decisions. I want to lead a state where we have given the government of Minnesota back to the hardworking, forgotten Minnesotans who have made this place so amazing. That's where I want to take Minnesota, and I know together we can get there. I hope to earn your support today, and I thank you for everything you do. So there you have it. That is the Republican endorsed candidate for governor. That's uh, Jeff Johnson. Now we're going to do a little bit of a recap here. Um, like we did last week with the uh, DFL, we're going to take a look at any Republican primaries. And we're going to start with the governor's race. Uh, so yes, uh, Jeff Johnson uh, with Donna Brookstrom as lieutenant governor candidate uh, is the Republican candidate. Um, Matthew Cruz and Teresa Leffler are also running in the primary. Nobody knows who they are. I don't see them going hardly anywhere. However, 
the big 800 pound gorilla in the room, actually probably the 8,000 pound gorilla in the room, is former Governor Tim Pawlenty and current Lieutenant Governor Michelle Fishbach. And it's going to be Johnson versus Pawlenty, and that's going to be the biggest race on the Republican ticket as we head into primary season. Uh, for Secretary of State, John Howe is not facing a primary challenger. Uh, neither is his DFL opponent, Steve Simon. Uh, State Auditor Pam Myra is not receiving a primary challenge. Neither is her DFL opponent, uh, Julie Blaha. Or Julie, uh, Julia, yeah. Uh, for Attorney General, I stand corrected. There are three Republican candidates. Doug Wardlow is the endorsed Republican running against perennial candidate Sharon Anderson and former state representative Bob Lassard. I think he's like 82 years old and he decided he's going to run. Uh, I haven't heard from Bob Lassard in years. He's actually a former uh, DFLer from the Iron Range. And just like the Republican primary has three candidates, the DFL primary has even more with Keith Ellison, Tom Foley, uh, Deb Hillstrom, Matt Pelican, and Mike Rothman all duking it out for the right to go against the presumed Republican candidate, Doug Wardlow. For the U.S. Senate, Jim Newberger is running for the seat held by Amy Klobuchar, as I mentioned earlier in the program. He does actually have Republican challengers as I look at the St Secretary of State's uh, filings. Uh, Merrill Anderson, Ray Hart Anderson, and Rocky De La Fuente are all challenging Newberger for that nomination. And Chances are Newberger is going to get it. The other three are perennial candidates who don't normally get more than like four to ten percent. And then in the other U.S. Senate special election against uh, the seat formerly held by Senator Al Franken, you have Bob Anderson who lost the endorsement to Karen Housley, uh, Nikolay Nikolaevich Bay. Uh, another perennial candidate, uh, he's running, and then Karen Housley is the endorsed Republican uh, candidate there. So for Senate, Republicans are pretty much safe to say that Jim Newberger and uh, Karen Housley will uh, return back to their, uh, face their respective challenges. And then on the DFL side, Amy Klobuchar will most likely, uh, about 99 percentile, get, uh, um, get through the primary. Tina Smith versus Richard Painter, I'm not sure. And, and as I discussed last week, there were like five or six candidates, six candidates running for the DFL endorsement for the other U.S. Senate seat. But Tina Smith and Richard Painter are going to be the two heavyweights. That is going to be the contest to watch. So political season is now upon us. We are getting closer and closer and closer to having to make a decision. But right now it's the summertime, so enjoy it because we've got parades coming up. You don't necessarily have to work a parade for a political candidate, but don't be surprised if sometime this summer, if you show up for a political candidate or for a parade, if you show up to a parade, you might see a political candidate. Uh, this is going to be an interesting election cycle. I know that in the spring and even last year, we were hearing a lot about a blue wave. I don't think nationally a blue wave is going to happen. And I say that because when I see what's happening with the economy, voters vote their pocketbooks. That's the number one rule in politics. Voters vote the pocketbook. If the economy is down and you're an incumbent, you're going to have problems. Well, the economy is not down right now. And if that holds true, then voters are less resistant to making changes. So that means incumbents might have a safe seat, you know, a, a, a bet an easier time. However, in Minnesota this year, we have six of eight congressional districts up for grabs. I've lived in this state for almost 30 years. I have never seen six of eight congressional seats up for grabs. In the first congressional district, that is held currently by Tim Walls. Well, Tim Walls left that seat to run for governor. He's running in the uh, DFL primary for governor. In the second congressional district, that's Jason Lewis. 
and Jason Lewis is fending off a well a, a prime a, a, a challenge from a whale heeled Democrat running on her second attempt. Uh, that being Angie Craig. Uh, Congressional District Three, Tim Paulson. Uh, Tim Paulson. Um, Eric Paulson. Eric Paulson, I know Eric, uh, but Eric Paulson is fending off a challenge, most likely from Dean Phillips, although Cole Young is uh, also challenging on the DFL ticket. Uh, Paulson is in one of those purple districts that it could go either way. It's been reliably Republican for, well, longer than I've been here, but as redistricting occurs, it becomes more vulnerable, and there's no doubt that the Democrats are going to throw money into that seat like they have in Congressional District Number 2 in order to try to get two pickups. Uh, districts 4 and 5, well, District 4, uh, you have a situation where... Greg Ryan, the Republican candidate, is most likely not going to be anywhere close to Benny McCollum. Sorry, Greg, that's the way it goes. Uh, he's going to have to do a whole lot better than what he is. Um, and then in District Number Five, that one is. It's going to, there's three candidates running for the Republican endorsement, uh, Bob Carney, uh, Christopher Chamberlain, and Jennifer Zielinski. Jennifer is the endorsed Republican candidate in that race, but that is the one that Keith Ellison is vacating, so that one's an open seat, and you've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, five candidates running for that position, and most likely whoever wins the DFL primary is going to win that seat. District 6 is uh, Tom Emmer. That one is going to be uh, pretty safe. Uh, District 7 is uh, Colin Peterson against uh, Dave Hughes and or, or Matt Proche. Uh, Dave Hughes is the endorsed. Uh, Proche is challenging him. And that one came down to the wire two years ago, so that one is targeted by the Republicans. And then you've got a bunch of Democrats running against uh, Pete Stauber for the 8th District. That one, $25 million, went into the 8th District two years ago. And there's no doubt in my mind that that's going to rival that same amount this time around. That's kind of your political rundown as we head into the primary season. And we are going to leave you with music. We are going to leave you with 1972 commercial from President Richard Nixon's re-election campaign. This is Nixon Now. For Dallas Pearson producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis, reminding you that there's 186 shopping days left until Christmas. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.